So this morning I want to talk about pass the baton with that being uh, uh, in, in the, the forefront of the thought. Uh, but first, let me kind of define or, or explain what I feel is happening to, to some of us, maybe not all of you, but some of us. I know some of you have perfect lives with no problems, no issues, and, and you know, you will be laying hands on the rest of us after service. Just uh, uh, go ahead and prepare for that because I know some people live perfectly in perfect harmony and peace with everything around them. But the rest of us live in reality. <laughs> I would invite you to come to reality, but I would hate to burst that little bubble that you live in. So one of the words that has been going with me lately has been distraction. You know, I was thinking last night, God, when I get up there and I say distraction, I wonder if anybody's going to be able to relate to this. (laughs) I guess that answers my question. The word distraction means a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. It is an extreme agitation of the mind or the emotions. It is mental confusion. This is according to dictionary.com. These are the definitions. It is a thing or that prevents someone from giving the full attention to something else. It is a sh- extreme agitation of the mind or emotions. I know y'all haven't had that. And it is mental confusion. I love how the Lord speaks in those moments that that are impromptu. We're supposed to be instant in season and out of season, right? And I love when the Lord speaks in those moments and he just gives you revelation and understanding and and words of encouragement. I was uh, in an impromptu meeting this week uh, with someone that I I did not know. I'd never met. We met and began to have a conversation and God was opening the door for me to speak life into this person. And that's what I'm used to hearing from the Lord out of that moment. So I just kind of relax. I'm like... Yeah, because it's happened so many times. It's just like God gives revelation and, and words of wisdom and encouragement and so forth. It was so dry. It was awful. And by the time I left, I was thinking, man, I hope I didn't mess that dude up. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was just like everything was stopped. And the word I've been hearing is distraction. The enemy is trying to distract and he's trying to frustrate our purpose. He's trying to bring mental confusion or emotional agitation to frustrate our purpose because God has us building something right now. We're in this place of transition and transition is a difficult season. You're not what you were, but yet you're not what you're going to be. I think of transition like a teenage boy. (laughs) One day, he talks like this. And it seems like overnight, he talks like this. I came in one day and Jay, I was like, hey, daddy, you want to go? It seemed like just overnight, he's like, hey, dad, you want to do this? (laughs) I'm not old enough to be a father to a man. (laughs) And then there's that day in between. Hey, Dad. (laughs) You don't know who you're talking to. (laughs) It's like the schizo voice. You don't know what it's going to (laughs) be. So that's kind of where we are. It's a very volatile stage. We're in that transition and we're not quite where we're going, but we're not where we've been either. So we're in this phase of transitioning or transforming into God, uh, into who God is making us. And it's dangerous. It's unstable. Right? It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. You don't fit into what you did fit into and you don't quite fit into what you're going to fit into. It's just awkward. I used to wonder if they would make quarter sizes to shoes because one shoe was just a little too big and one shoe was just a little too small. (laughs) And you would think that I could fit everything because average size, you would think that'd be the most pop. No, no, you can't. (laughs) So you're in this transition place transition means a process or period of changing from one state or condition to another we are in a process of changing into who the lord has us to be and it's a difficult process you don't have to turn here but ezra 4 4 
and 5 says, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. And they bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The word frustrate there is para, and it means to break up, to break asunder, to cast off, to cause, to cease, to defeat, to disappoint, to dissolve, to divide, to make of no effect, or to frustrate. A lot of words there for the definition. But listen to those. It means to defeat, to cause to cease, to disappoint, to dissolve, or to divide. Those right there explain so much. When, when God has us transitioning into a new season, Satan comes in to dissolve, to cause to cease. See, if we grow not weary in well-doing and we faint not, we will reap in due season. But sometimes in the, in the doing well, in the doing what is right, in the, uh, uh, in the going forward, sometimes it feels like we go into autopilot. It seems like the brain kind of shuts down and we begin to go through the motions and the enemy says, what's the point in this? And then bad things begin to happen and frustrations begin to happen and the enemy says, see, this is your fault. This is your doing. And the Lord is just saying, press through this season, press through this time, for in due season, at the right time, you will reap if you don't give up. So we're in that place and the Lord is saying, just keep going. Just keep going. You've got this. Keep pressing. Keep moving forward because you are transitioning into who you are supposed to be. That's good stuff, y'all. See, the church is going through a transitional period, the, the, the body of Christ. Being, being a Christian or the Christian walk is not just about being saved. That's, that's the introduction. That's day one. That's, that's, that's freshman class. We get saved. We receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we make him Lord of our life. Sometimes we forget that part. We don't just confess him. But we make him the Lord of our life, the head of our life. And when we make him the Lord of our life, <coughs> then all of a sudden we are in a new place. We are now belong to a new body. We have now cleansed our DNA and have received a heavenly DNA. At that moment and at that time, we now become joint heirs with Christ. We now become a people who are seated in heavenly places, according to Ephesians, there with Christ in the spirit. We are a new people. So that's the beginning. But then there is a purpose. And Jesus told the disciples, he said, pray after this manner. Our father who art in heaven. Oh, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in this earth as it is in your heaven. In other words, oh, father, oh, holy, powerful father. May your rule and your reign exist in this earth just like it does in heaven. This is why Jesus told Peter, you, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. They, he was telling Peter, I'm giving you the responsibility to bring heaven to earth. Oh, that's amazing. So he calls us the church. The word church is ecclesia. Ecclesia is a term in the Greek that means a governing body. So when the Lord looks at, the, at his people and he says, my church. And by the way, when God looks down, he doesn't see a white church and a black church, a Hispanic church and an Asian church. He sees his church. The blood bought, the called out, the redeemed. So he looks down and he sees the church and he sees the unchurch. He sees the saved and the unsaved, the saved and those that need to be saved. That's what he sees. So he looks and he says, I call this people not a congregation, not a local body. I call them a governing body. 
because I want them to govern and legislate in the spirit. I want them to sit in a heavenly place and begin to legislate my rule, my will in the earth today. That's powerful. So the church is transitioning into her place as spiritual legislatures. That's good. I wish we had more believers as, as natural legislators now. Matter of fact, I just wish we had more people with common sense as legislators. Let's start there. <laughs> Some of the rules they pass. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to get on politics. That's a soapbox, and I do not feel the spirit of the Lord on a soapbox. <laughs> But let's just say if we cut taxes and make everything as a, as a federal, it's really not right to raise all the state stuff so that we actually are hurt worse. I'm just going to leave that alone. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Lord, let the state transition <laughs> with some new legislators. <laughs> so we're, we're, in the, we're in this midst of, of the church stepping into her place. We're in this very unique season of transition. In, in Ephesians, it, it, it tells us that we don't war against flesh and blood, but against the, the, the spirit realm, against principalities and rulers of darkness, right? So the, when you read Ephesians 6.12, it gives you four different uh, uh, levels here. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness in this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So these are four levels of this warfare. And I haven't changed gears. I'm still in the same place. So level four is the spirits in heavenly places. This is a spirit realm warfare. Level three is territorial it is territorial spirits. Level two is external attack. Level one is right here. It's me. So I was praying the other day and I began to have two words going through my, my, my spirit. Strong man and giants. Strong man and giants. Well, I'm thinking we are the people that are to drive out the giants, to dispossess the giants from our land. That's territorial warfare. A giant in Scripture, every time you find the word giant or Nephilim or Rephim, you will find that they were a, an authority over a region. The Anakim possessed or controlled a region. So when the, when the uh, uh, spies spied out the land, what they saw was who controlled the region. See, we can talk about giants and we can say that there's giants in our lives, spiritual strongholds, and, and we can call them giants. And, and you know, by, by inference, you can, you can say that that's right. But really what we deal with is the strong man. See, we need to be operating in a level three warfare, taking back our territories, which is spiritually governing. But we need to get free first at level one. We need to get free here. We need to get free here. If I am bound up by perversion or addiction or whatever problem is in my heart, and then I go out here to the city and I begin to break the strongholds over our city, I am setting myself up. That's like a drug addict going to tell the police about a drug deal. You are opening yourself up because you have a vulnerability. You have an open door that is screaming, hey, Satan, come attack me. So we're supposed to be tearing down the, the, the strongholds in the, or the territorial spirits in the area, dispossessing their control over our region. Guess what? It's not too late for Strop City. It's not. It's not too late for Walmart. Walmart is ripe for revival. Amen. In order to have a solution, you must first have a need. There is a need at Walmart. So, so, so we look at our city and we say we want to take our city back. We want to take Monroe back. 
I think in some ways Monroe's worse than Bastrop. At least I know these people up here. <laughs> so there's territorial spirits. We need to take back our territory. God has something in store. He has revival in store for Bastrop. He has not only a spiritual revival, but an economic revival in store for Bastrop. But he needs the church to begin to govern in the spirit and take back the territory. But if the church is so bound up in their self... So he's looking for the people uh, uh, to, to bind the strong man. You can turn there if you'd like. You don't have to. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 29 says that we must bind the strong man. It says, or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? So the, the strong man has to first be bound. And then you flip over to 43 and it says, when an unclean spirit or a strong man has gone out of a person, if it passes through the waterless places seeking rest, but it finds none, then it says, I will return to my house for which I came. And when it comes and finds the house empty, swept and put in order, then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. Now here we are, this is talking about a personal deliverance. The church has got to walk in personal deliverance. How can we deliver somebody else if we are not delivered? How can we minister freedom from bondage to someone else if we are bound? The first thing first, we've got to be free. Over the summer last year, I was praying and I saw a bin in the middle of the church and people walking by and placing shackles in them. And then I look up and I see another bin by the ceiling and I see suit coats that are floating in that, in that bin and there's a lock on the gate and then a key came into uh, that lock and unlocked it and the gate opened up. And I don't remember if it was before that or after that. I was going home one night and I was praying and, and it may have been that night and I got close to the house and I saw an image of myself bending over in a coat like that and it ripped down the middle and the Lord spoke and said, the mantle that is on you is too small. You've outgrown it. I'm about to release to you a new mantle. So combined with that, I began to minister uh, in the church about breaking free uh, of the shackles, which is old sins and cycles and mindsets and all of this stuff. We got to break free of all of that so we can receive a new mantle. So for six months, eight months, I've been ministering along those lines and, and it's been confirmed over and over by many ministers and, and it's been stirring back in me the last two weeks is that this is where we are. We're at the close of that, of that point where the Lord is saying now is the time. It's been a process of breaking free. But the process is coming to a close and we are receiving freedom. Complete freedom. Offense, criticism, pet sins. I can tell you I've felt more criticism on me the last few weeks than I have felt in months. I'm not saying you're criticizing me. I'm saying that I have felt that spirit come against me. I mean, so much so that I, I've been real careful on, on even how I pronounce words. And I guarantee you, if you want to find somebody make a mistake as an orator... Think about this. Those of you that went to college, what's one of the first classes you have to take is speech. Well, my first speech was supposed to be five minutes. Do you know how long five minutes is talking to people? So I was so nervous. I graduated a little bit early, so I was young when I started college, and everybody in the room, it was a night class. That's the only thing they had open for speech. It was a night class, so most of them were, were old. They were like late 20s. And so my first speech, I got up there, and I was like, I stared down at my paper. It was supposed to last five minutes, and I did this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Thank you very much. My name is Justin Akers. A five-minute speech lasted two minutes and 13 seconds. I got a C. Now, a two-minute message lasts an hour. 
So guarantee there's a possibility and a probability I'm going to mispronounce or misstate or invert something in that hour. It was, I had a good message the other day and, and, and it came across really well. It was very anointed and I was so pleased with how it went. And, and so I went to, to do the video for uh, YouTube and I was listening to it and I said, I can't put that out there. Lord, I can't believe I said that. I'm listening to it, and there were things that I said that I wouldn't dare let out. It was a good message, though. If I could just edit out, you know, 15 minutes of that hour would be great. I don't know where my point out that was. Criticism. I have felt that spirit of criticism. The critical spirit is something of the old season. If you are bound by a critical spirit, you will find yourself criticizing everything. When you uh, uh, go on a fault-finding mission, you will find fault in everything and everyone. Period. Oh, well, their hair's too long. Oh, well, theirs is too short. Theirs is too blonde. Theirs is too brown. My soup's too hot. My soup's too cold. Well, Goldilocks, go get another bowl. It, when you go on a fault-finding mission, you will find fault. If you are bound by something, then that needs to be broken off. We have to bind the strong man so we can be free, so we can operate as the ecclesia, as the body of Christ, uh, 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 overcrossing, transcending denominational lines and racial barriers. All these divisions we have, we need to be the body of Christ. We are a gate church. We oversee a southern gate into our city. We need to be governing over our gate into this city. But if we're bound, we can't. Then we move into third level warfare. We actually get victory over second level warfare. I'm so not worried about Jezebel in this hour. Don't take that as a, as a naive statement of ignoring the reality or effectiveness. I promise you there, there will be few people you will meet that will ever be as convinced of the reality of Jezebel as yours truly. I stared her in the eyes. <laughs> However, I feel such a freedom from that battle in this season. We're not fighting Jezebel right now. We're fighting the enemy trying to prevent us from transitioning. See, when, when you start having those, uh, uh, those things stirred up in you, when you start having those old, I was talking to two people this week. They were just hours apart from each other, and I don't even think they know each other. And one person texted me the other night at 11 o'clock, and, and they said, aren't you excited about what God's doing? I was like, yeah, I sure am. And I know you are. And they texted back and said, yeah, but you know, the last couple of days have been kind of rough. So we go back and forth, and, and I'm, I'm telling this person what the Lord's speaking to me, and they're telling me what the Lord's speaking to them, and, and it's just a real good conversation. <clears throat> and I said, my guess is that you, would be, uh, you have probably fought some warfare recently, but don't worry, that's part of transition. And they said, boy, have I. The other day, it was all like two weeks I went through that I just, it was like a brick wall. I could not get into the Spirit. I couldn't hear from the Lord. I couldn't worship. I couldn't do anything, and it was just blocked. And, 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 and then all of a sudden, I got up the other day, and it was like it was free. And, and it, they said, Justin, uh, it was amazing because the other day I began to fight against old mindsets that I haven't dealt with in probably over a decade. And I haven't dealt with these things. And it's like they bombarded me and I fought through them. And then I woke up Wednesday morning and I was free. And then I turn on the news and I see that Billy Graham had passed away. And I said, God, what does this mean? I talked to another person just hours later, and they said, I have been dealing with old mindsets. Now, these, person, uh, these two people do not, as far as I know, don't even know each other, but I know they don't communicate. And this person said, I've been dealing with old mindsets that I have been struggling with, and it was like something broke off of me the other day, and then I hear the news that Billy Graham had passed away. What in the world is going on? 
See, this is what's happening is God has taken us through a transitional period and he is closing out the old season and the door closing of the old season is our freedom. Freedom from old mindsets, old sins, old struggles, old cycles because we are stepping into a new place. He is seating us in a higher place and re uh, 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 releasing to us a new mantle. That's good. Turn to Numbers chapter 13. Last week I did such a good job at getting y'all to lunch on time. And then I had to wait on my food. Wait on my drink. And I thought, you know, the people in our church, we are king's kids. They shouldn't have to wait. So I'm just going to keep them in service long enough that when they get to the restaurant, it'll be cleared out. You're welcome. That was so nice. Numbers chapter 13, I love this story. We'll actually read out of 14. I mean, you can read 13 if you'd like, but one of my oratory difficulties is reading long passages. My eyes get ahead of my brain, or my brain get ahead of my eyes. I'm not sure which, but either way. So we're going to read that of 14, but let me give you the story from 13. They come to this place, and, and, and uh, Moses knows that what's over this, this uh, ridge, o over this area, is the promised land. So he takes 12 spies, one from each tribe, and he says, go spy out the land. So when they come back, these, uh, uh, these, these 10 spies say, oh, no, we can't take the land. There's these giants in the land. These two spies, these, these you know, the extremists, <laughs> the radicals, the Holy Ghost, spirit fill, fire, breathing, tongue, talking, revival, believing too. They come back and they said, Moses, you should see how big it is. And Moses is like, yeah, I heard the giants are big. And Caleb's like, giants, I'm talking about the grapes. They're like this. Moses, we're fixing to get fat. Joshua and Caleb saw the fruit of the land and the other 10 saw the giants. The last verse of 13 says that they saw them, the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. So we seemed to them. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, so therefore we seem like that to them. We saw ourselves as weak, therefore they saw us as weak. We saw ourselves as unable, therefore they saw us as unable. They gave the answer to their problem in their own words. If we had seen how big we were, they would have seen how big we are. If we would have recognized how big our God is, then they would have seen how big our God is. Those of you that had a close relationship with your father, you know how it is when you're a little kid and you're walking through the dark. The dark is scary when you're a kid, but not with daddy. You hold on to daddy's finger. There ain't no dark. There's no sound in the dark. Nothing can bother you because you got to hold a daddy's finger. It don't matter. You hear something? Daddy, what was that? Oh, it's okay, son. <laughs> All right. The boogeyman is scared of daddy. If the Israelites would have had a hold of God's finger, they would have looked at the Anakim and said, bunch of little giants. <laughs> They answer the problem for themselves, and then they begin to attack. This is where it gets very interesting. They begin to attack, and then, and then Caleb responds in this great way. He says in verse, let's start in verse 6, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Japuna were among those who had spied out the land, and they tore their clothes and said to the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are what? Bread for us. 
Oh, I love that. Caleb says, dude, they're our bread. Don't you remember Leviathan that tried to stop us from crossing the Red Sea? We ate him. Again, we go get fat. The land is flowing with abundance. Can't you see this? There's nothing we're lacking. And then they decided to stone them. And then the power of the glory of God came in and separated the people from the leaders. And said, you're not going to touch them. But now here's where he gets. Look, look at, at, at verse 20. It says, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. This is right after God and Moses had this conversation. God says, I'm about to judge them and I'm, I'm going to destroy this people. And Moses says, oh, please, God, don't do that. They're your chosen people. And we, we have this back and forth uh, uh, argument or discussion, debate on how we're going to discipline the children. And Moses wants to go easy and, and God wants to destroy and, and God relents. And he pardoned according to his word, verse 22, but none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land in which he went. So this is what God says. He says that old generation can only come so far. They can't go any further. I'm not focusing on their lack of belief in this, in this moment, but what God said was that those that represented an old generation can only come this far. There is a border to how far they can come, and the next generation that picks the baton up, they will go into the next season. Now, this is very interesting. Because when I, when I look at, at Dr. Billy Graham, such an amazing man for a generation of people. And when I think about the generals of faith, now you got to understand over the last hundred years or so, we've had a lot of generals in the faith. You have the Amy Simple McPherson's and the William J. Seymour's and the A. a. Allen's and the William Brennan's and, and Old Roberts and all, uh, you had just a laundry list of people. But the most recent three to me personally are Billy Graham, Old Roberts and David Wilkerson. These were the last three generals of the faith of this generation. One representing the prophetic. I've never seen anybody represent the prophetic like David Wilkerson, except for Jeremiah and, and Elijah. Modern day prophets. Nobody has represented that prophetic mantle, the mantle and the authority and the office of a prophet to a nation like David Wilkerson. I have never seen anybody move in gifts of, of conviction and salvation and literally transforming an entire nation like Billy Graham. And I've never seen anybody operate in the miraculous and have so much of a heart for the miraculous like Old Roberts. So you have these three generals of the faith and the Lord is saying they can only come so far. I've only purposed for them to come so far. See, we can argue about Elijah, but Elijah had an, a, a, a point that God said, Elijah, you can only come so far. Now, I'm not going to let you live long enough to pass away. So I'm just going to take you in a chariot of fire because I have a plan and a purpose for that. But you can only come so far. I have set a border to your time. Acts 17. I have planned a, a limit to how long you will walk this earth. But don't worry, because I'm going to give you an Elisha to lead into the next generation. He, he looks at Moses and he tells Moses, you can only come so far, but I'm going to release to you a Joshua to go into the next generation. That's good stuff. Our generation, the previous generation, those that represented the previous generation. So if you are alive today, I'm not talking about you. You are the young generation. <laughs> I 
I had someone tell me the other day that I act like I'm 10 years older than I am and look like I'm 10 years younger. I said, Lord bless you. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm 20 years older. And when I look in the mirror, I see 10 years older. So thank you. <laughs> if you're alive in this generation, you are this generation. You are the Joshua, Caleb, Elisha generation. The previous generation has gone as far as they could go. God extended the life of Billy Graham for a reason and for a purpose. What is that reason and purpose? You and I probably will not understand until we get to heaven. And then somebody will tell us and we'll be like, oh, that makes complete sense. But for whatever reason, God extended his life to this point, even though he was ready. And heaven was ready, but the timing was not there. Now the timing is there. Billy Graham's gone. The last of these generals... The word that the Lord gave me a year ago was, or two years ago now, was an Elisha generation or Elisha season. What is marked by the Elisha season is a double portion of the previous generation. It's not just about Elijah and Elisha. It's about a generation receiving a double portion. So now we have O. Roberts, David Wilkerson, and Billy Graham, and a generation that says, Oh God! Let us receive a double portion. Let us walk and double the, the anointing of all Roberts. Double the miraculous. Double the salvations of Billy Graham. Double the prophetic of David Wilkerson. Let us receive a double portion mantle of the generals of our faith of the last generation. That's powerful. Oh, that's powerful. We are, we are the generation. You can turn there if you'd like. You don't have to. I'm going to read through a couple quick things. I'm preparing to close. But I'm also preparing already for tonight. So, <laughs> so we'll see how close that comes. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, this is when Moses passes away. The first part of it is, is uh, the end of, of Moses' life. He releases this mantle to Joshua. And then he passes away and they had a season or a time of mourning. And then jo in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, it says, And then Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. That was a releasing of the mantle. When Moses laid hands on Joshua, it didn't say that Joshua was already full of the spirit of wisdom. It says that now Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. It was an impartation to the next generation. Hebrews 11, now I'm just going to read a couple of verses to you from Hebrews 11. Verses 13, 39, and 40. Verse 13 says, These all died in faith. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with Hebrews 11, it's the hall of faith. It talks about uh, uh, Moses and Abraham and, and uh, Sarah and, and down the list of the hall of faith. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Verse 39 and 40 says, And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. And then 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely to us and let us run our race with endurance. Now, the imagery that, that the author of Hebrews gives is a, uh, a relay race where there is a baton passed to the next generation. And he says, don't you understand? They did not receive their promise but they, uh, they greeted it from afar off. But God saw it better that we could join with them and see it fulfilled through us. Don't you know that we are surrounded by such a great coliseum 
of witnesses that have gone on before us. So lay aside the weight that would so easily beset you. Take your baton in your hand and run your race. Can't you see it? The great Colosseum. Baby, I see you looking on, on the iPad. I don't know what the message says in that. By the, by the way, we have so many great translations you can get. We have no excuse for a lack of knowledge in this generation. The Passion Translation, if you don't have that, you need that. And if you don't have it, look it up online. You can get it right there. Billy Graham on this side. Or Roberts on that side. David Wilkerson on that side. I say that they may be all sitting in the press box together. I don't know. But they're taking turns taking the mic. Because Billy Graham, he's grabbing the mic and he says, I made it. I got my ticket into the Coliseum. Old generation that I have left. Take my baton. It is for you to see double the salvations that I saw. It is for you to preach the truth even better than I preached it. Lay aside the weights that so easily beset you and run my race. Take my baton and keep it going. And old Robert says, and when they get saved, get them healed, boy. <laughs> Grab them by the head and break the devil off of them. Receive a double portion of my boldness. Receive a double portion of the miraculous. Oh, old Roberts was timid. He would stay in his room until he felt the Holy Spirit come on him. And they would come and say, Oh, Brother Roberts, it's time for you to take the stage and speak. And he would say, Leave me alone. The Holy Spirit hasn't rested yet. He was not scared of man, but he had a healthy fear of the Lord. And then someone would come up and they would say, well, this child, he doesn't have any eardrums. His body never developed. And he would say, come here, boy. And he would grab him by the head and he would begin to pray. And I think he just prayed so intensely that, that he shook. <laughs> Because I remember one video I was watching, I saw this little boy's head just. <laughs> he like a little bobblehead on the dash. And when he got through, the little boy's crying. Not because of whiplash, but because he could hear. So R. Roberts is in that cloud and he said, come on generation. My students at ORU. You are in righteous line of an inheritance. My sons and my daughters, move forward. Oh, David Wilkinson sits back. And he says, that's going to be great. And now I release to you a double portion of my mantle as a prophet to a nation. Wake a sleeping church up. Wake a dead nation up. Oh my goodness. See, something shifted on Wednesday. What was the date? Anybody know February 20, 21st? On February 21st, 2018, there was a shift in the spirit realm. There was an earthquake in the spirit realm. And Satan himself said, oh no. It's time. They've shifted. They've spitted. <laughs> the generation is taking the baton. They're taking the mantle. Let me show you one last thing. Second Kings chapter 2. You can turn there. You can look it up. Second Kings chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Certain verses I print out so I can have them in big font so I don't have to put on my binoculars to see them. If I read my Bible, I have to put on binoculars. I can pull up my phone and zoom in. 
but then I can't move it. Oh, the frustrations of technology. 2 Kings chapter 2, 12 and 13, And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and he rent them in two pieces. This is powerful right here. Elisha looks up, and he sees Elijah being taken up in the chariots of fire. He takes the mantle in which he already had, and he rips it in two. He says, I don't need my identity anymore. I don't need the power and the authority that I've been operating in any longer. I have now outgrown this mantle that is on me that is of my own doing, and I break it in two. I don't need it. You know why he broke it in two? Because if you tear something in two, you don't go back and pick it back up and put it on. Unless you're a teenager. And then you rip it up so you can look cool. But he took his mantle and he ripped it in half just for one reason. He said, I don't identify with that any longer. That's not me. And then, verse 13, he took also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. That word mantle means glory and power. That's the Hebrew meaning of that word mantle. So he laid aside his own identity, his old mantle, and he took upon him the glory and the power that Elijah walked in. There's a generation right now who is renting their identity, who is renting their mantle, and they are receiving a double portion mantle from the previous generation. Oh, that's good. See, Moses went as far as he could. Old Roberts went as far as he could. David Wilkerson went as far as he could. Billy Graham went as far as he could. The previous generation went as far as they could could now this generation see it's it's loss is sad but we've had generals dying for two decades three decades i think that that in many ways my father was 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 a general most definitely to us kenneth hagan senior so many have died along the way. Matter of fact, Kenneth Hagin died September uh, uh, 2003. Daddy died October 2003. In that same, same three-month period, there were at least 12 ministers that I knew of that all passed away in the, in the three-month period. And before that, there was a prophetic word coming forth about a changing of the guard and the enemy uh, uh, targeting generals of the faith. See, the enemy thought he won. He should have learned by now. 2,000 years ago when he thought he won, all of a sudden the ground began to quake. The clouds begin to swirl and the veil in the temple was split in half. He should have known it didn't work that time. What makes me think it's going to work again? Every time he tries to take somebody out, God just says, don't worry. I'm going to increase the anointing. Y'all stand with me this morning. See, there is a Joshua generation. They're not, it's not a Joshua generation being birthed. It's not an Elisha generation being birthed. It's a Joshua generation taking their place being filled with the spirit of wisdom. It is an Elisha generation that is receiving upon themselves the double portioned mantle. And we are breaking the strong man off of ourself because there are giants in the land. And we are about to take back our territories, amen.